Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Indie Alaska is an innovative weekly web series capturing the diverse and colorful lifestyle of Alaskans. Real stories of everyday Alaskans at work and play. Supported in part by Alaska Pipeline Service Company. The National Weather Service. Good Tuesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on this 21st of October. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your latest weather information and observations and forecasts. You can do that easily by going to weather.gov slash Alaska or arh.noaa.gov. Now, if you've been visiting with us at AFN over the last uh, day or so, you've probably seen a web page that we offer from weather.gov slash Anchorage on your mobile device. If you dial it up there on your mobile page, uh, you'll get the web version of that, and if you save it to your homepage, it acts just like a weather app. You can find your forecast for Bethel or Nome or Nepakniak, anywhere you like, and save that on your uh, homepage of your cell phone. It uses just a little bit of your bandwidth, so it's really light and doesn't uh, make any more uh, damage to your bill there, so pretty easy to use. Great way to stay up to date with Alaska weather on your phone if you're in the bush. Now the weather info line, 1-800-472-0391. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and on YouTube uh, in between the shows of Alaska weather. Here's some of the weather headlines that we're talking about in the office today. Along the Arctic coast, as you well know, it's been a blustery day, especially around Point Hope, up through Point Lay, and the Chukchi Sea coast have seen some stronger winds than most other areas there. Uh, meanwhile, uh, areas of uh, snow continue around Barrow, out toward Wainwright, and heavy freezing spray will be an issue as we head through tonight and again tomorrow as gales continue offshore. Southeast, gales continue there through Wednesday. It looks like the wind will continue to batter the coastline as uh, two areas of low pressure are working their way up into the eastern Gulf. The Gulf, the Aleutians, and the Bering are still looking at gales at least through tonight, in some cases through tomorrow. But for the interior, high pressure is breaking up the clouds inland. So if you haven't seen a whole lot of sunshine around places like McGrath and the lower and middle Yukon Valley, there should be some more sun coming your way here in short order. Here's a look at the Bering Sea now in the North Pacific, and you can see waves of clouds rotating around in a counterclockwise fashion. The upper atmosphere right now has low pressure sitting right on top of Alaska, and it's guiding that colder air in, as is seasonably appropriate, of course, for the yukon Kuskokwim Delta, Norton Sound, the Seward Peninsula. On the back side of that is a ridge of high pressure bringing in more moisture from eastern Asia and over Japan. You can see that plume running right up into the uh, eastern side of the Kamchatka Peninsula and eastern sections of Asia there. There's several other waves of low pressure right now, but it doesn't look like anything that's uh, necessarily related to uh, a typhoon that will bring a tremendous surge of moisture coming our way. So uh, all in all, status quo for late October in Alaska. As we look at the rest of Alaska, you can see one wave of low pressure here west of Haida Gwaii. That's bringing up some stronger winds and additional moisture there. It's been a little soggy around Juneau today, only about a tenth of an inch, maybe a little more there around the region, but the slightly stronger winds and some stronger gap winds there for southern parts of southeast. Uh, you've had some gusts on the order of 35 to maybe as high as 55 miles per, per hour briefly. Out across south central, another round of clouds is moving from south uh, east, I'm sorry, northeast to southwest, and this should bring in some drier air from some of the more drier regimes of uh, eastern Alaska range and uh, the Copper River Basin should see fewer clouds as we go. Up across the Brooks Range, there's been some stronger gusts there as well. Some of those gusts on the order of 35, even 45 miles per hour, maybe a little bit stronger. And it's been a pretty breezy day across the Arctic coast. Some of the strongest winds here southwest of Barrow into uh, the Kotzebue Sound region, around Kotzebue and Nome. You can see more clouds there, occasionally some snow showers running down the western side of this low pressure system. Look at the loop one more time, and once again, you can see that circulation rotating in that counterclockwise fashion. That's moving the surface low pressure systems up the eastern side of the Gulf and allowing those clouds to zip right over the Alaska Peninsula and generally east of Unalaska. Though northwesterly winds there occasionally are bringing uh, just a little burst of snow showers, maybe some drizzle through the region. 
Here's a look at the surface chart now. The low pressure you see across the eastern Gulf is at 971 millibars. There's pockets of rain around that frontal boundary that's slowly moving northward. This is going to cycle in on itself and eventually drag up another wave of low pressure. So watch for that here in the future charts coming up. Saw some pockets of fog around Gulf Canna earlier today. And uh, just before leaving the office, it looked like uh, Fort Yukon saw a tremendous drop in visibility down to maybe about a half mile with some heavy snow in the region. So things look a little white outside in Fort Yukon. That's probably what's going on. A little bit of snow falling over the Yukon Flats at this hour. Across the Arctic coast, uh, pockets of uh, light to moderate snow from time to time. And you can see that packing of the pressure gradient up across the Beaufort and the Chukchi Seas. Uh, high pressure is well to the north, but with strong low pressure down across the south, it has to equalize, and that's happening right now across the Arctic coast. A wave of low pressure is working across the western coast. With that, you see a few more clouds, and then much drier air out to the west with a ridge of high pressure extending from the North Pacific into the Gulf of Anadir, and another wave of colder air out toward the west. As we get into tonight, low pressure is moving north and west. It's still around 974 millibars, so gales are going to continue across the open waters and for many across southeastern Alaska. Watch for some pockets of rain and maybe mixing it with some freezing rain or just snow across northern parts of uh, the southeast, including the Chilkoot and uh, White Pass regions. Up across some of the higher terrain of the Alaska Range, you might see a snow shower or two, but that should be trending away as we get into tomorrow and for Thursday. Much drier air is already developing around the Yukon Valley. Snow showers will continue across the Brooks Range and across the Arctic coast itself. Some of that may lower the visibility around the Chukchi Sea. High pressure is trying to gain control at 1,020 millibars. And out across the southern Bering Sea coast, uh, offshore of uh, the Pribilovs and along the Bering Sea coast of the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern Aleutians, watch for some light rain there. The next decent weather disturbance that's working its way northward now is at 996 millibars. That's working up toward the Gulf of Anadir. High pressure is going to slow that advance a little bit as it comes in from the south and west, but uh, for places like Attu and even further west, a much better chance for some rain and southwesterly warming winds. And you'll see that warmth spread northward quickly as we get into the forecast here in the next couple days. For Wednesday, remember I said there was two systems working uh, kind of against each other at this point across the cent central and eastern Gulf. Uh, the previous storm is working around on the western side. The next wave of that is working northward toward Haida Gwaii at 988 millibars. With rain moving in from south and east, you'll see the uh, skies remain pretty murky, it looks like, for Wednesday afternoon for southeast. The wind should subside somewhat as we get a little bit of a lull between each frontal passage. Snow showers will move their way northward, so more people will be in a better chance for seeing light rainfall. And notice around the middle and lower Yukon Valley, including a good chunk of the Yukon Kuskokwim coastline, even Bristol Bay, you're looking at drier air and probably more of a sunny day than what you've had for the last few for sure. Across the upper Tanana Valley in the 40 mile country, still lingering snow showers there, especially in the morning. And low clouds and maybe some light snow across the Arctic coast, especially the coastal plain there. Uh, north of the Brooks Range, you have a much better chance for seeing some snow. And breezy conditions will continue as those winds blow in from the east and northeast. High pressure shifting ever so slightly toward the Bering Strait. That's going to lock in some low clouds and pockets of drizzle and light rain for Bristol Bay. And the storm out to the west advances a little bit more eastward, heading toward St. Matthew and the Pribilovs, with a ridge of high pressure also working its way eastward ever so slightly. As we get into Thursday, that decides to move a little bit faster. And as it approaches the western coast, by Thursday morning, areas of snow will be seen from Kotzebue Sound to Seward Peninsula, of the Norton Sound region, as well as parts of the Yukon Kuskokwim coastline. In the morning, Bethel's looking at snow. That should transition to more of a rain and snow type of a day by the afternoon. Maybe some freezing uh, drizzle uh, in the mix there, but we'll be watching for that to switch over during the day. So uh, this is what you'll start with, and then you might end up on the other side of that front. By later in the day, a frontal boundary across the Alaska Range should start to fall apart. And once again, look at all the dry air here across the lower and middle Yukon Valley, across South Central, and even Kodiak Island. Sunshine should be back for you by Thursday. Low pressure across the eastern Gulf is moving northward again. It's cycled in that previous storm. It's at 988 millibars. The winds may be a little bit stronger across the southern half of southeastern Alaska, but many across uh, Kodiak and points westward will be dealing with more of a northwesterly flow. And a cold front continues to work its way through the central chain, bringing rain and occasionally some gusty winds through places like Adak and Atka, but it doesn't look too bad at this point. Temperature-wise now, 40s and 50s for southeast this afternoon around 4 o'clock. Prince William Sound saw Valdez reach up to 46, 48 in Cordova, about the same there in Seward. Uh, Kenai was only 39, Anchorage 38, 39 around Squitna, Talkeetna, 35 for Fairbanks. Healy was showing 23 by this afternoon. 
32 around Eagle and 35 in Northway. Fort Yukon, colder at 4 o'clock. Remember, it was snowing there and visibility was dropping quickly. 28 degrees there. Arctic Village was 27 with Anaktivik Pass at 18. The Arctic Coast saw temperatures in the lower to mid-teens, especially the colder weather there west of Barrow to Wainwright and mid-20s for Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse and Cactovic at 29. 23 around Point Hope with Kivalina showing 30, about the same there in Kotzebue, 32 in Shishmaref, 36 in Nome. Norton Sound temperatures were at or just above the freezing point with Bethel at 27. Areas around Galena, 33, 34 in McGrath and temperatures around the Kuskokoon Valley generally at or just above freezing. Bristol Bay saw hit and miss temperatures there above 32. You can see Dillingham at 34, considerably warmer in King Salmon, Kodiak. Island was in the lower 40s, with most of the Alaska Peninsula in the mid to upper 30s. St. Paul, 40 degrees, with St. George only at 37. Dutch Harbor on Alaska also at 37 degrees and 40s for Adak, Atka, and Shemia showing 45. Overnight low temperatures will crash into the single digits and teens for many in the interior. Lower 20s for Fairbanks, South Central in the 20s and 30s, Southeast in the lower to mid 40s. Kodiak, you're looking at 33. Nome, 22. Barrow expected to hit 15 tonight. 30s for the Alaska Peninsula, 39 for Dutch Harbor and Unalaska, and mid-30s for the Privlovs with high temperatures tomorrow in the upper 30s and lower 40s for South Central, closer to 50 degrees for Southeast, some a little bit warmer like Ketchikan, Craig, and Kowak. 20s for the Arctic Coast, Nome once again at 32 degrees, 38 in Nunavak Island, St. Paul 42, and closing in on 50 degrees for the Western and Central Aleutians. Flying weather tomorrow includes a wide swath of IFR south of Sitka through the Dixon entrance and Haida Gwaii. Pockets of IFR for the Arctic coast and the coastal plain generally south of Atkasuk and southeast of Wainwright. And from St. Lawrence Island to Nunavak Island, expect IFR conditions with many in the bearings still holding on to MVFR, but most of the interior looking pretty good with VFR flying conditions tomorrow. Anaktivik Pass will be looking at IFR on the north side, but through the pass itself, MVFR or better. The same goes for Adigan Pass. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass should be at VFR through most of your Wednesday. Rainy Pass expected to be VFR. Windy Pass we expect to see MVFR. Same thing goes for Isabel Pass, but again, watch for IFR on the northern side. Mentasta Pass should see some improvements during the day toward MVFR. Tanita Pass right now looks to be visual through most of your Wednesday. Portage Pass we expect to see good flying weather. And Chilkoot and White Pass also expected to be VFR. Obviously, the surface freezing line is crashing southward just about every day, a little bit further south at times. Uh, the elevated freezing lines are nosing in on south central the Kenai Peninsula with levels from 2 to about 4,000 feet. You see similar conditions across southeast. And the next wave of low pressure up the western bearing is also working in the warm air aloft, anywhere from 2, 4, and 6,000 foot. Uh, levels there at 8,000 feet across the North Pacific. Icing potential seems to be limited. We've seen a lot of reports of isolated and light icing today. Some of that will continue below 4,000 feet across the coastal plain in the north and the Arctic coast. The upper Yukon Valley into northern sections of southeast, generally above 4,000 feet. Some of that over the open waters of the Gulf as well. A little bit lower ahead of the warm front working across the central bearing. That's above 2,000 feet, not across the west. Uh, some light to isolated moderate as that frontal boundary works across the western bearing above 6,000 feet. Now in the jet stream, of course, the fast, mover of river, uh, fast moving river of air that guides all the weather at the surface shows that very pronounced trough of low pressure here across the Gulf. That's allowing the cold to drop across the west coast and keeping things active across the eastern part of the Gulf. We've got another wave out here across eastern Asia, and that's allowing that storm track to really focus on areas out across the western Pacific with wind speeds up to 120 knots. Below that at 9,000 feet, we can see our circulation here across the Gulf of Alaska. Winds between 20 and 40 knots, a little bit of a stronger southeasterly flow at 30 knots, especially right along the coast. Once you get into the interior, the wind speeds really slow down to about 10, even 20 knots, working their way up across the Brooks Range and then dropping southward again across the yukon kuskokoom Delta. We get a little bit of a faster flow coming in from the north and west, south and west of the Privlovs, and then we're back into that stronger southwest flow across the western bearing. Look at 3,000 feet. The easterlies here are working across the coastal plain from 10 to about 25 knots. We see both of our areas of low pressure now at 3,000 feet here across the Gulf. 45 knot winds coming into Kodiak Island and north and easterly winds wrapping into the Dixon entrance around 15 knots with much slower wind speeds across the interior and across land areas. High pressure sitting south of Adak and Atka showing much stronger winds on the western side. They're feeding into the next storm, 50 to 55 knots and even stronger winds approaching uh, the Russian coastline. So turbulence, we'll watch for that across the open waters and generally south of Haida Gwaii. Over land, probably around Bristol Bay, the Alaska Peninsula, all the way out toward Nikolsky almost, below 4,000 feet. You might find some occasional moderate uh, turbulence there. 
Below 4,000 feet across the Arctic coast, you might see some light chop from time to time, and below 4,000 feet along the frontal system working across the western bearing. That's a look at your aviation forecast. We'll be back in just a few minutes with the rest of your marine weather. Stay tuned. During the past week, you have probably heard at least one news story about a missing hiker, a fisherman, or a pilot and passengers. If that missing person is someday you, the next seven minutes, the length of this video, can make a difference in whether you live or die. Two experts on survival, Captain Pete Savage and Warrant Officer Steve Lewis of the Alaska Army National Guard, have seven steps to follow if you ever find yourself stranded in the wilderness. The seven steps to survival are recognition, inventory, signaling, shelter, water, food, and play. Okay, when you ever find yourself in a survival situation, you kind of want to think of the seven steps of survival to kind of get you in the right uh, flow and uh, get you moving in the right direction to, uh, to successfully survive a situation that you might not otherwise uh, do. Recognition is probably one of the most important steps uh, in a survival situation because that's knowing that you're getting yourself into a bad situation and going, Hey, am I starting to get hypothermic? Am I cold? Uh, am I lost? Am I somewhere I shouldn't be? And do I need to hunker down for the night and so I'll make sure that I can survive the night and survive the next couple of days if that's how long it's going to take me to get out of this uh, specific situation or to get rescued? The second step to survival is inventory. That's checking every pocket, bag, and the surrounding area for anything that can help you survive. Inventory is also very important because there's been some uh, instances I've read about up in Fairbanks where a lady was with her couple of kids and or she was out for, I don't remember the specific amount of time, but it was significant and she couldn't start a fire because she didn't have any matches and then when she was at home uh, going through her stuff to throw it in the wash, I heard she came up with a little lighter in her pocket she didn't even know about. Um, and the situation could be uh, even worse than that, so make sure you check all your pockets, check all your su survival gear and all the little pockets in your pack and so on, look for anything that might be useful and never throw anything away. You can imagine that a safety clip might seem insignificant uh, at, at one point, but a day later it could be something to go tie your jacket back together if, if a zipper broke. You basically have active signals, uh, like your flares and smoke signals and fires and so on that take a, a moderate amount of work to keep going, whereas your passive signals, your panel markers, uh, VS-17s, uh, and so on, uh, you just lay out and Lewis says a key thing to remember about active signals is to make sure that before you use them, an airplane or search party is close enough to see the signal. Uh, there's lots of situations where people pop their smoke or pop their flares, and there's no planes or anybody around to see it. And then they're gone when the plane does fly by, and a plane could fly right over the top of us right now. Uh, if we didn't have a way to signal them, we'd, we'd be out of luck. Shelter is the fourth step to survival, and Savage and Lewis show us how to construct a lean-to using just natural vegetation, common to many areas in Alaska. Here you have a, a lean-to shelter using skunk cabbage leaves like shingles to dissipate water from the roof of an improvised shelter. Not only can you use natural vegetation, but you can use water repellent materials such as a poncho, a visqueen, uh, even the skin of a plane can be used in a shingle type fashion. These are very water repellent and they uh, are very good natural vegetation. You'll find them in a lot of low-lying areas. Uh, you also have pine boughs that we can use. They'll break the wind uh, from entering the shelter. I'm going to stay warm and dry. That's the biggest thing. This primarily keeps me dry from the wet ground. I put it on. One match here, get it down here. You start with small kindling and tinder, and you make sure that gets going good. Okay, once I've got my fire started, it, it dissipates most of the bugs. It throws a little heat this way into the shelter. I want to block maybe any wind coming in with my big uh, leaves from the skunk cabbage. I can either use that or boughs. Take the bivy sack put it on up over my shoulder, and now I can lie down. 
and uh, rest. Your body can't function very long without water, so the fifth step to survival is water collection. Savage explains how to collect and purify water in the wilderness. Um, we have a number of uh, items set up like a poncho, poncho uh, uh, catch, uh, catch basin, which water comes down as it comes down from the sky as rain catches in a basin that's made from your poncho and it filters out through the neck of the poncho where you can either have a canteen at the bottom where you can catch that water for drinkable water. You can also use water out of streams. Uh, the only problem is that some of the streams have um, algae and bacteria in them that can make you sick. So they do make filters now like Kakadin water filters which are ceramic filters which it'll, it'll screen some of the microorganisms in the water so that it won't affect you that are fairly small and miniaturized that you can put in a survival kit. They also make uh, tablets that will actually kill the bacteria or the microorganisms in the water, but you're still drinking it without a filter filtration system. As your animal comes across here and trips this thing here, pops down and the uh, rock hits the animal. And voila, dinner. Food is an obvious component of survival, but keeping a high morale is also important. Savage and Lewis combine the final two steps for survival, food and play, into one, showing how to make the search for food fun. What I have is I have is a rope with a little stick tied on the back of it. What I do is I just stick it through here, do the little A, inverted A you have here, and it basically locks back there real easy. And what then you do is you take this and kind of turn it down so that you can stick a trigger stick under there that would just barely hold it back there rather than really severely holding it back there. You stick the stick back there. Then this little triggering device is where you're going to have your food and the animal just has to just barely touch the food and the rock comes dropping down. What you see here is a rabbit coming down the game trail You'll look at the snare that has the piece of peanut butter. My hand, being the animal, will go ahead and grab the bait stick where the morsel is. And he thinks he's going to get away with it, but as he trips it, he gets caught. I'm caught on the wire. You can see this wire here that's to the stick, and I can't get away. For a quick check of our sea ice edge, you can see ice is uh, still freezing up across uh, the uh, Beaufort Sea coast there, but a lot of this is on the move too, with strong east and northeasterly winds blowing off pieces or strips from the main ice pack that's also shifting southward. We can get some growth just west of Barrow and along the Chukchi Sea coast. We're also seeing some freeze up there inside of Kotzebue Sound and inside of Norton Sound as well. Now one thing to keep in mind, if the winds go calm, there will be additional ice forming fairly quickly. You can keep up to date with this at our weather page at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice dot php. Now for southeast, look for northerlies coming out of the Lynn Canal and through Stevens Passage in Frederick Sound around 20 knots with four foot seas. But the predominant flow along the coast and across the southern areas will be more from the south and southeast. Along the coast, winds up to 35 knots with seas from 16 to 17 feet and 3 to 5 feet inside of the Dixon entrance. For Thursday, the winds shift to more of an easterly offshore direction, 20 knots to as high as 35 knots down in the south. Northerlies continue inside some of the inner waterways as high as 25 knots there around Stevens Passage. And for the Chatham Strait and Clarence Ch Strait, you're looking at more of a southeasterly flow with winds to 30 knots and 6 to 10 foot seas. For south central and east to northeasterly flow coming over Prince William Sound on the western gulf from 15 to 25 knots, 30 knots as you get into the eastern barrens and east of Kodiak Island. Look for 11 foot seas there in the west. Shelikoff Strait and west of the barrens looking at 5 to 8 foot seas and Cook Inlet 2 to 5 foot seas for Wednesday. And that should diminish as we get into Thursday with more of a variable flow in the northern Cook Inlet. Westerlies coming across the barrens at 30 knots with 6 to 8 foot seas and you can see the winds are diminishing across Prince William Sound and the northwestern gulf to about 10 to 15 knots with westerlies across Kodiak Island from 20 to 25 knots with 8 foot seas outside of Kodiak. Now for Wednesday across the Alaska Peninsula, higher gusts will still be an issue as the winds are crossing through some of those gap areas, so watch for that. 10 to 11 foot seas on the Pacific side and 5 to 12 foot seas on the Bering side with the lowest uh, 
sea height there around Bristol Bay, looking at 25 knots there from the north and west. By Thursday, the wind shift to more of a westerly direction and diminished somewhat 20 to 25 knots and still looking at northwesterlies at 30 knots there in the Pacific with 8 to 11 foot seas on Thursday. For the Aleutians, a west and northwesterly flow for the central and eastern chain, 15 to as high as 35 knots there around Unalaska and Nikolsky, and 35 knots south of Nikolsky and Unalaska in the Pacific side with 12 to 13 foot seas. The west and southwesterly winds are already picking up thanks to the storm lifting northward and bringing in that warmer and wetter flow. By Thursday, you can see the winds shifting just a little bit around Kiska and Attu, 20 to 25 knots with 10 foot seas, and west and southwesterly winds are building in from Nikolsky to Adak at 25 knots with 9 foot seas in the north and 6 to 7 foot seas in the Pacific and 6 to 8 foot seas on either side of Unalaska with winds from 25 knots. Northerly is coming out of the Bering Strait and freezing spray will be an issue around St. Lawrence Island and points northward but probably just for a day with 20 knots there coming all the way through Nunavak Island and outside of the Kuskokwim Delta. Northwesterlies for St. Matthew and the Privilogs with seas as high as 12 feet there around the islands. But then the winds shift to more of a south and westerly direction and winds build to 30 knots from the south and west with seas up to 14 feet there. 11 feet around St. Lawrence Island and 25 knots from the south and west coming into parts of the YK coastline. So watch for uh, some uh, stronger winds and waves coming in that uh, six foot seas there offshore on Thursday. Across the Arctic coast, a different story on Wednesday. Stronger easterly flow continuing with heavy freezing spray and gales also. Look for northerlies inside of Kotzebue Sound, 25 knots with an 8-foot sea. By Thursday, though, more of an east and southeasterly flow north of the Bering Strait. We keep our stronger easterly flow from Barrow to Kaftovic, 30 knots with 8 to 9-foot seas expected there. A quick recap tonight shows low pressure in the eastern gulf. Periods of rain and wind will continue. The winds should subside as we get into tomorrow, though, with pockets of snow showers diminishing across the interior, with the exception across the coastal plain, where areas of fog and light snow may continue as we head into Thursday. A storm is moving across the western bearing. That will bring warmer winds and a shift to more of a southwesterly flow coming into Thursday. And that could start for snow across the west coast Thursday morning, transitioning to more rain and snow as we wrap up the day there. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather and be safe out there. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. It's never too early to set expectations and goals for your child's education. The UA College Savings Plan provides opportunities that can help you reach your educational savings goals. Save in Alaska. Study anywhere. There is more information available by calling 1-888, the number 4, and then Alaska. This message sponsored by the UA College Savings Plan.